You had the wealth of the Swiss banks and the authority of the Vatican all in one place because Delphi was glittering with treasure. Treasure laid up for the gods, really for the glory of man. Delphi was believed to be the center of the Greek world. It became an enormous architectural site. The Roman writer Pliny observed 3,000 monuments there. The most important was the great temple of Apollo. This was the center for the oracle. If you wanted to look into the future in the ancient world, if you had any kind of question about what was going to happen, there was only one place where you could be really sure that you would hear the voice of God, and that was Delphi. In such a superstitious society, the oracle was consulted on every issue. Delphi was a great expert, the ultimate expert. Big politics, shall we go to war? Or the intensely personal things, who's the father of the child? The sheer difficulty of reaching the oracle served to enhance its mystique. But why cite the complex 2,000 feet up a mountainside? The reason lies in a legend which records how a herd of goats was the first to experience Delphi's mystical power. Grazing on the hillside beneath Mount Parnassus, the goats were reported to have been overcome by sweet-smelling vapors. The story goes that the goats themselves began to speak. Their words were interpreted as prophecies, and the belief in the oracle at Delphi was born. In Athens in the 6th century BC, a politician called Cleisthenes believed he could use the oracle to his advantage. He needed to raise his political status, so he decided to build a temple at Delphi where the magical vapors appeared. He dedicated it to Apollo, the god who could predict the future. So the first task was to build a retaining wall of stone for a massive terrace 70 feet wide and 190 feet long. The columns were made from local limestone. To look good in the eyes of Apollo, Cleisthenes paid for a splendid facade to be built from imported marble. He believed the expense was worth it. He was anxious to win the oracle onto his side, to help him win political support back in Athens. His gamble paid off. Legend recalls that Cleisthenes was blessed with good fortune and his career was greatly advanced. At the temple, it became the practice for a woman known as the Pythia to reveal Apollo's prophecies. The male priests had their own reasons for this, for if a man was to have this power, he would become more powerful than the priests themselves. But women had no power at all, and the priests at the temple could control a lucrative industry. Priests of Apollo were busy behind the scenes. A woman was chosen to speak because she could be manipulated at times of men's choosing. Like theater, the priests worked hard to stage manage the event. It was important that the clients felt that they'd been given an accurate prediction. There have been many attempts to explain how the Pythia entered her trance-like state, from poisonous honey cakes to narcotic substances. But could a recent scientific investigation provide the answer? Experts exploring the geology of Delphi found two major fault lines in the hillside. And these lines in the rock meet directly beneath the room where the Pythia sat in the Temple of Apollo. Knowing toxic gases can emanate from fault lines, the scientists tested a stream that still flows near the temple. They found evidence in the water of ethylene, a sweet-smelling gas that can cause a trance-like state and even delirium. By becoming the supreme authority and the central point of the Greek world, the Oracle of Delphi remained influential for over a thousand years, all the while answering the Greeks' desperate desire to know the future. To honor their gods, the ancient Greeks created wonders that forced them to make extraordinary technological discoveries. One such breakthrough was a theater built to honor the god Dionysius. 
It was the greatest theater in the Western world with the most advanced acoustic design. Hidden in the hills of Epidaurus, about a hundred miles from Athens, the 14,000 seat theater has dazzled audiences for two and a half thousand years. It is a feat of engineering. 55 rows of stone seats built into the hillside with such precision that the theater has perfect acoustics. This theater at Epidaurus is quite simply the most special theatrical space in the Western world. It's the largest of all the surviving ancient theaters. It's the most beautiful. This is somewhere where the spirit of the god of drama, Dionysus, still lives on. Surprisingly, the reason for citing the theater in this remote place has its origin in medicine. Next to the theater was a vast healing center, and to the ancient Greeks, theater was medicine. One way of trying to understand the link between the healing cult and this particularly exquisite theater is that for the ancient Greeks, music, and, and Greek theater is a fundamentally musical experience, was actually used in medical therapy. The great philosopher Aristotle actually writes about how people who are distressed and, 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 and psychologically disturbed can come to um, a great resolution of that and to a much happier state of mind by listening to certain kinds of music and watching certain kinds of performance. At the adjacent healing center, the god of medicine, Asclepios, and his magical snakes were said to work miracles. Medical cures and remedies were inscribed on stone tablets. Shrines were built to the cult of Asclepios, and the center developed into a wealthy healing sanctuary. People came from across the empire to cure every ailment and disability. In 360 BC, the money collected from patients was used to build a vast theater. The architect, Polycletus, had already built a roundhouse at the sanctuary, but now set about a far grander circular design. He chose a bowl-shaped site facing west, so the rising sun would light up the landscape behind the stage. He dug out the round performance space before creating the huge seating area, known as the gazing space. Thousands of limestone blocks cut from local quarries formed the seats. His design was for 32 rows, although 23 more were added two centuries later. Behind the actors was the scanner the origin of the word scene, a two-story stage building which was painted as a backdrop for the play. The scanner also enabled early special effects. When a play required a god to descend from the heavens, an actor was flown in on a hoist. The masked performers often played to audiences of up to 14,000 without the benefit of microphones. Polyclitus was able to create perfect acoustics. Even a coin being dropped at the center of the performance circle can be heard clearly in the back rows. The design of the theater also enhances the sound of the human voice. The secret lies in how sounds are reflected by the stone itself, reducing the amount of distorting echo. A sound is produced by somebody's mouth. It will hit a wall, that's a reflection. And what they've done in Apodavros in order to create a large quantity of short reflections is that they've broken up the surface. You know, there is no surface which is flat. So when a sound hits a wall, it's diffused in many, many directions. It enhances the original sound by kind of stretching it a little bit longer than it already is. And in the quest for perfection, the Greeks developed another technique to make the sound even clearer. When somebody speaks in a theater, you can hear resonances. And if you have an ear for it, you know which re resonances are going to get in the way of the, of the dialogue. So if you were to find something that can take those resonances out, then you're laughing. And that's exactly what they tried to do. They used a resonator, which they would tune to the frequencies that they wanted to take out and to the reflections they wanted to take out. And they would embed them in the wall. Two and a half thousand years later, the theater is still entrancing audiences. The place that has inspired for millennia remains one of the world's finest theaters.